pathology. That's Is that correct? correct? Sir. Yes, sir. You personally conducted the autopsy of President John Kennedy on November 22nd. Is that accurate? Yes, with the assistance of uh, Commander Boswell and Colonel Fink. What was your specific responsibility in connection with that autopsy? Well, <laughs> the, uh, I was summoned from my home late in the afternoon of that day uh, by the Surgeon General of the Navy and the Commanding Officer of the Naval Medical Center and the Commanding Officer of the Naval Medical School. Uh, much to my surprise, was told that uh, the body of the late president was being brought to uh, our laboratories and that I was to uh, examine the president and ascertain the cause of death. Approximately what time of the day or night did the autopsy begin? Well, the president's body, as I recall, arrived about 7.35, 7.40 in the evening. And uh, after some preliminary uh, examinations, about 8 or 8.15. Just very briefly, in what order or sequence did you conduct the autopsy? Well, the first thing we did was make many photographs, which uh, uh, we knew would obviously be required for a wide variety of purposes. Uh, took basically whole body, whole body x-rays and then proceeded with the examination of the two wounds that we very shortly detected were uh, present starting with the wound in the head and proceeding to the wound in the back of the neck, upper thorax. Would it be accurate to state that the photographs and the x-rays were taken not only to document the condition of the body at the time you examined it, but also um, to provide a record of, of that event? Is I that think correct? that's obvious, yes, sir. About what time of the night was the autopsy finally concluded? Oh, I would uh, estimate around midnight. You, I believe, have been at the hearing today uh, at least part of the time and therefore are aware of the fact that uh, the committee has chosen and had worked for them a panel of forensic pathologists. Yes, indeed. You may have heard part of the testimony which reflected that the panel reviewed your report of the autopsy. And of course, as you know, the panel also spoke with you on one prior occasion. With respect to the ultimate findings that this committee will, of course, need to wrestle with. There is apparently from the testimony today one possible major area of disagreement and that is with respect to the location of a bullet wound in the back of the president's head or possibly depending upon uh, the total body of the evidence whether there was one or more than one bullet holes in the back of the president's head. That is principally what we wish to discuss with you at this time. Let me ask you first, your autopsy report reflected that there was one and only one bullet wound to the back of the president's head. That it did enter in the rear, exited the front. Is that report accurate? on those three points, to Absolutely. the best of your knowledge. Absolutely. I'd like to show you what has been admitted into evidence as Exhibit 48 during these hearings, a drawing of the back of the president's head. The committee has received evidence from Ms. Ida Docks today that that drawing is an accurate representation of photographs taken during the autopsy that, and I believe the drawing represents photographs from the autopsy numbered 15, 16, 42, and 43. But apart from the testimony of Mrs. Dots, have you had an opportunity to compare that drawing 
with those photographs to determine if it fairly and accurately uh, duplicates the photographs? Uh, yes, I have, Mr. Cornwell. And I, I believe that it does. The particular photograph that this drawing represents, I take it would have been taken as part of the normal procedure of the autopsy and for the same reasons that you previously described, all of the photographs were taken, is that correct? Correct, to document the positioning and appearance of the wounds. All right. In the process of examining that among the other available documentary evidence in the case, our panel of forensic pathologists, of course, were not present during the autopsy, did not have access to the body, and therefore you and your colleagues who were there are in a unique position to provide testimony as to the nature of the wounds to the president. In that connection, as you recall, the panel invited you and you responded voluntarily, in fact, as I recall, on very short notice. You responded to an invitation to come speak to them informally. They, I guess we could say, interviewed you as to your knowledge on the subject of the autopsy in the National Archives. In pertinent part, the transcript which was made from the tape recording of that interview at pages 12 to 13 reflects that you reviewed not only that drawing but a x-ray of the president's head and identified the small droplet in the lower portion of the photograph as a wound of entry and that that was the only wound of entry. Later in the transcript at pages 39 to 40, the following colloquy occurred. Dr. Petty of the panel said, going back to the earlier discussion, can I go back to another interpretation which is very important to this committee? I don't really mean to belabor the point, but we need to be certain, as certain as we can be, and I'm showing you now photograph 15. That, of course, was a photograph from which that drawing was made. And here, to put it in the record, is the posterior hairline or margin of the hair of the late president. And there, near the midline, and just a centimeter or two above the hairline, is an area that you refer to as the in-shoot wound. That, in other words, was a verbalization of the description of the location of the small droplet near the bottom of the head. You replied, Dr. Humes, yes, sir. Dr. Petty then continued, also on this same photograph is a ruler, and approximately two centimeters or so down the ruler, and just to the right of it is a second apparent area of defect, and this has been enlarged and is shown to you in an enlargement, I guess number 16, which shows you right opposite the one centimeter mark on the ruler this defect, or what appears to be a defect. Thereafter, skipping a small portion and going to the very next page, 40, you replied, I don't know what that is. Number one, I can assure you that as we reflected the scalp to get to this point, there was no defect corresponding to this in the skull at any point. I don't know what that is. It could be, to me, clotted blood. I don't, I just don't know what it is but it certainly was not any wound of entrance. Would it be accurate to state first, Dr. Humes? Yes, sir. That at the point at which you made the statements we have just referred to, you were called rather unexpectedly from your normal occupation, came to Washington, and with no preparation or no referral to prior notes immediately therefore, immediately prior to that, were shown this and other evidence and made the statements that I've just referred to. That's correct, and I'd comment that I was similarly summoned uh, on Tuesday of this week, uh, 48 hours ago, for this appearance. Likewise, with no 
attempt. There are no chance for preparation and no I idea of what questions were to be directed towards me. And we apologize for the short notice in both cases. Fine. I hope we can straighten it out. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you if you would agree to various portions of what are reflected on this photograph. First, that in the original photograph, there was shown, as on the drawing, a ruler. Is that correct? That's correct. And in addition, there were the hands which are shown, which appear to be holding the scalp so as to expose some portion of the back of the head. That's correct. Would you also agree that in the original photograph, the hair in the upper portion appears to be wet, that in the lower portion appears to be relatively dry? I wouldn't be. Would you also agree that the hair is spread apart in the upper portion of the photograph, exposing portions of the scalp, and that in the lower portion, the hair is in a relatively natural position? I would. And finally, would you agree that the relative center portion of the photograph has what you, upon initially being shown this photograph in the archives by our panel, could not identify, that's what you said might be a clot or some other item, and that it's relatively off-center in, in the overall photograph, the part you identified as being the wound of entry. The locations are as I described them. Uh, yes, apparently. Now, I'd like to ask you today if you have had at least a greater opportunity to look at the photograph along the lines that I have just indicated to you, and if after doing so, you have a uh, more well-considered or a different opinion, or whether your opinion is still the same as to where the point of entry is. Uh, yes, I think that I do have a, a different opinion. Uh, number one, there was a casual kind of a, a discussion that uh, we were having with the panel members, as I recall it. Uh, number two, and I think before we talk about these photographs further, if I might comment, uh, these photographs were made on the evening of November 23rd, uh, 1963. I first saw any of these photographs on November 1st, 1966, almost three years after the photographs were made, was the first opportunity that I had to see those photographs. And at that point, uh, Dr. Spaswell, Fink, and I were asked to come to the <clears throat> National Archives to categorize these photographs, label them, identify them, and we spent many hours uh, going through that. It was not uh, the easiest thing to, to accomplish, I might say, after uh, three weeks short of uh, three years. But we identified them, and I think in light of the very extensive opportunity that various panels of very well-qualified forensic pathologists have had to go over them, we, we did a reasonably accurate job in uh, catalog, uh, cataloging these uh, photographs. So that uh, I saw them on that occasion. I saw them again on the 27th of January of 1967 when we again went to the archives and, and made some summaries of our findings. I go back further uh, to the original autopsy report which we rendered uh, in the absence of any photographs, of course, and we made certain physical observations and measurements of these wounds. Uh, I state now that those measurements that we recorded then were accurate the best of our ability to discern what we had before our eyes. We described the wound of entrance in the posterior scalp as being above and to the right of the external occipital protuberance, a bony knob on the back of the head you've heard Dr. Bodden, the committee members have heard him describe today. And it's obvious to me as I sit here now with this uh, markedly enlarged uh, drawing from the photograph that the upper uh, defect to which you pointed or the upper object is clearly in the location of where we said approximately it was above the external occipital protuberance. Therefore, I believe that that is the wound of entry. 
Its relative position to bony structures underneath is somewhat altered by the fact that there were fractures of the skull under this, and the president's head had to be held in this position with making some distortion of, of uh, anatomic uh, structures to, pr to get, produce this picture. By the same token, the object in the lower portion, which I apparently, and I believe now erroneously, previously identified before the most recent panel, is uh, far below the external occipital protuberance and would not fit with the original uh, autopsy findings. I'd like to show you, in addition to the photograph or the uh, drawing which is now on the easel, what has previously been admitted as exhibits 52 and 53, and also what has previously been discussed as exhibit 302. I don't believe, Mr. Chairman, that exhibit 302 was previously admitted into evidence, and if it was not, I would ask that it be admitted at this time. Without objection, it may be entered into the evidence at this point. First, Dr. Humes, with respect to the x-rays, have you also today had an opportunity to look at those x-rays? Uh, yes, sir. I would ask you if you would mind stepping to the easel and describing for us what your view or your opinion would be as to the location of the entry wound on that x-ray. Okay. I believe, and particularly in this rather enhanced uh, picture, I might say, it's a pleasure to have such because I didn't have anything of this kind uh, formerly, that this would be the point of entrance. For the record, simply, would you try to describe the point that you just indicated? Well, this, in this approximate area would be the, where the external occipital protuberance would be, the knob we can feel in the back of our head. This would be above it. There's a great enlargement here, uh, so it looks considerably further away than it would be on a standard size film or on, the, or on the skull, and I believe that this is above the external occipital protuberance. I think it also shows on a film that Dr. Uh, Biden was showing earlier, I think it shows even better in the AP view of the, the inner posterior view of the skull. All right. So then you would, in, in effect, agree with the testimony of Dr. Biden that the entry wound on the x-rays is at the point in which there is a, simply from a novice's point of view, a, a dislocation or a, yeah, a, a jutting out. Fracture line. It's a point. It's a fracture line that juts out from that. Right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I might. Add, and more importantly, I had the opportunity, which none of the gentlemen had to do, to examine the president's skull from the inside when the brain was removed in great, with great care. There was one and only one wound of entrance. I think we're in a somewhat of a semantic uh, discussion as to where it was. And would you agree that the fragments shown in the upper portion of the skull would also be relatively consistent with that same uh, entry location on the oh, yes. skull. However, this bullet was so disrupted, those fragments, I think, could be virtually any place. And referring to exhibit 302, which is 
the, the one on the very left, the yes. uh, drawing of the brain, yes. would you also agree that the disruption of the brain as shown in that drawing is also in the upper portion and therefore would also be roughly consistent with that same entry yes, location? Dr. Humes, you've indicated that you, of course, worked under the handicap, which, of course, was caused by conditions beyond your control. During the autopsy and the writing of the report, of not having the autopsy photographs to work with, is that correct? Nor the x-rays by the time we were writing the report. Nor the x-rays. Your initial autopsy report indicated that as you have just stated, the wound was indeed above, I believe the report is worded in terms of slightly above, the external occipital protuberance. Right. The testimony today indicates that the panel places that at approximately 10 centimeters above that external occipital protuberance. Would that discrepancy be explainable? Well, uh, I have a little trouble with that. Ten centimeters is a significant uh, uh, four inches, you know. Four inches? Uh, I'd like to simply ask you a few specific questions in order to determine... I'd go back to the fact it was only one, you know, <laughs> period. To determine whether we can understand how such a discrepancy might have occurred. The autopsy was completed late at night, is that correct? That's correct. After it was over, what did you do next? We stayed to assist the uh, morticians and their associates to prepare the president's body. How many hours did that take? To about five o'clock in the morning. Then what did you do? I, uh, after the president's body was removed, half an hour or so later, I went home. Did you get any sleep? Uh, uh, not too much. I had to take one of my children to a religious uh, function that morning. And, uh, but then uh, uh, returned and made some phone calls. Got a hold of the people in Dallas, which was unavailable to us during the course, as you've heard from Dr. Biden, and I couldn't agree more with the apparent findings of his panel as to problems that we had and hope they would not ever be repeated. And spoke with Dr. Uh, Perry and learned of the wound in the front of the neck and things became a lot more obvious to us as to what had occurred. And you finally then began to write the autopsy report at what time? <sighs> well, uh, three, it was decided that three people couldn't write the report uh, simultaneously, so I assumed the responsibility for writing the report, uh, which I began about uh, 11 o'clock in the evening of uh, Saturday, November 24th, having rested for four or five, six hours in the afternoon and uh, worked on it till three or four o'clock in the morning of Sunday the 25th. Did you have any notes or records at that point as to the exact location of the... I had the draft notes, which we had prepared in the in the uh, autopsy room, which I copied. Was the distances between the wound and the external occipital protuberance noted on those notes? They were, it was not noted in any greater detail than, uh, than it appears in the final report. So the, dis uh, the exact distance then above the ex external occipital protuberance was not noted? It was not notes. noted with the feeling, of course, uh, that the photographs and x-rays which we had made would of themselves uh, suffice to accurately locate this uh, wound. I only have one final question. First, however, I've, the notes are no longer in existence, is that correct? The original notes, which uh, were stained with the blood of our late president, I felt were inappropriate to retain, to turn into anyone in that case. I, I felt that uh, uh, people with some peculiar ideas about 
uh, the value of, of that type of material uh, they might fall into their hands, I sat down and word for word copied what I had on fresh paper. And then destroyed them. Destroyed the ones that were stained with the president's blood. The final question is, you were present throughout the entire embalming uh, operation, is that I correct? was in the morgue from 7.30 in the evening to 5.30 in the morning. I never left the room. During that period, were there efforts made to reconstruct the president's head? Uh, yes, indeed. Would it be accurate to state that those efforts entailed handling of the head over a long period of time? Uh, very accurate. Dr. Bodden testified that Exhibit 302 and the other photographs which we have of the brain may not be entirely complete, although they show nearly the entire circumference in all directions. But you would have become familiar during that period of time with all of the, I suppose, exterior of the head in order to reconstruct it. Is that correct? That's correct. And based upon that, is there any question about the fact that there were other bullet holes entering the head? I was absolutely convinced at that time that there were no such. I have had no reason to change my opinion in the intervening 15 years. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Any members of the committee seeking recognition? Dr. Humes, under the uh, rules of our committee, any witness uh, may have five minutes in which to explain or in any way expand upon his testimony before our committee. I extend to you at this time, such time if you so desire it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I certainly don't uh, choose to avail myself of uh, five minutes. Uh, I would, having heard most of what uh, Dr. Biden said and the findings of his uh, Committee of Forensic Pathologists, I think the committee was uh, very well advised to uh, gather such a distinguished uh, group. I wish I had had uh, the availability of that many people and that's much time to reach the conclusions that I and my associates were forced to reach in uh, approximately uh, 36 hours. Um, I hope that the committee in its wisdom will make recommendations to appropriate authorities to preclude such a difficulty in the future. I would say that our, our testimony, I, I, I and my associates are quite elated in fact that the findings, to the best of my knowledge, the substantive findings of all the various panels that have examined these materials in such great detail are in basic accordance with what we originally uh, ascertained to be the situation. Uh, we are pleased by that. Our testimony before the Warren Commission uh, is quite lengthy, as I'm sure some of the committee members are aware. However, I, f I feel it also was hampered by our inability, number one, to never have seen after uh, about midnight of that night the x-rays, to never have seen at any time until a year or two after the Warren uh, Commission the photographs which we made. I think uh, had we had those opportunities, some of the confusion and difficulties which seem to have arisen might not have uh, uh, arisen. I'd be pleased to answer any other questions from you, sir, or any member of the committee. <coughs> Well, Dr. Humes, we certainly want to say to you that I think all of us can understand the, the very trying circumstances and conditions under which uh, you were called into action under, uh, after this very tragic event. And uh, we're indeed appreciative of the testimony that you've given here this afternoon and the other cooperation you've shown with our, our panel. And uh, for that, we at this time wish to thank you very much. And you are now excused. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be of help. Thank you.